Hallelujah. Well, we are, we've been looking at the tabernacle. How many of you have been with us the last several weeks with the tabernacle? How many of this is maybe your, your first experience? You don't have to hold up your hand. That's embarrassing. I don't want to do that. But um, um, we've been looking at the tabernacle and the symbolism of the tabernacle. Um, and tonight, I, 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 f- I felt like I needed to uh, be very practical with you. And uh, just in review for just a moment, I, I really, last week, highlighted this with you, and that is that the tabernacle sat in the center of, the, of all the camps of Israel. Uh, three camps to the west, three camps to the south, three camps to the north, three camps to the east. But it sat in the center of, of, of Israeli life. And I, I made this statement uh, that Christ needs to be the center of your life, the, the core of your being. And I thought to myself, um, I need to maybe, maybe make that more practical. So I, I wrote down several things that are just practical as to how to accomplish making Jesus Christ the center of your life. Um, here's the first one. Acknowledging that Jesus has the ultimate authority and yielding control of your life to him. You know, um, a lot of people want to be in control. But if you really want Jesus to be the focal point of your life, the center of your life, you've got to yield control of your life to him. Would you agree with that? Amen. Uh, Here's the second thing. Consult him in prayer about every decision throughout the day. I really mean that. Um, Now, there are certain things you don't have to pray about. You don't have to pray about whether you get up and get ready to go to work in the morning. You don't have to pray about that. You need to go to work, right? But... There are a lot of decisions that we make in life that we don't pray about. And then what we do is we, after we make those decisions and are in the process of living out those decisions, we say, oh God, please bless that. Wouldn't it be better? I'm just asking. Wouldn't it be better if we ask God's direction? Because here's the thing. God has already blessed his direction. Right? So it would be better if we would Ask his direction, what he desires, before we make those decisions. So pray about that. Here's the third thing. Make this decision up front in your family. Uh, Many of you are husbands and wives. You have children. Some of you have grandchildren. Uh, Make this decision. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Make that decision. Now, here's the thing. In the day we're living in, there are going to be a lot of distractions for that. A lot of distractions. But you've got to make up your mind. We're going to serve the Lord. Uh, The reason that Daniel was so successful in Babylon, if you read the story of the book of Daniel, the reason he was so successful in Babylon was because when he was a young boy, he made up his mind he was going to serve the Lord. You read it. It's in the first chapter of Daniel. Make up your mind. As for me and my house, we're going to... That's just some practical, practical things. We're going to serve the Lord. Number four, ask yourself this question. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? How would Jesus respond? When that car cuts you off in traffic, how would Jesus respond? I just feel conviction right now. Because we respond in such a humanistic way. Because we're almost expected to respond in a humanistic way. But how would Jesus respond? I want to encourage you. I mentioned last week, encourage you to, to get online or order a book called In His Steps. Read, I, I, I read that book every year. Every year I read that book. It's just a little book. You can, you, it doesn't take real long to read it, but I read it every year. In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. It's about a congregation that for a year... Uh, a pastor asked his congregation to not make one decision without asking this question, what would Jesus do? That's where we get our little bracelets. You know, we wear those little bracelets. What would Jesus do? And then we do what we want to do. <laughs> yeah, so what would Jesus do? Here, here's, here's number five. Realize that you carry the glory and the presence of God. You are an image bearer. You are a sanctuary for the Holy Spirit. You 
are the glory of God. Realize that. You carry his presence wherever you go, wherever you go. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm because, not, not because people know I'm, I'm a pastor, but, but sometimes I go into places and, and uh, uh, people will say, you know, hey, um, you know, uh, we shouldn't say that um, around him. Well, good, I'm glad. Don't, don't say that around me. Don't take those words around me. Don't, don't do that. Because I sense that there's something, they sense there's something, there's something different. And uh, we, we shouldn't shy away from that. We shouldn't shy away from that. I used to go to family reunions. And, and may I just say, a lot of my family are heathens. Uh, I say that online because they know they're heathens. And they need to get saved. I hope you're listening. Really, I'm serious. And I used to go to family reunions, and, and, and I would walk up to a conversation, it would go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, don't let Sheldon in on this, because you know he's a Christian. Good, I'm glad you recognize that. <laughs> Good, I'm glad I stopped that conversation. So you carry the very presence of God. So uh, just some practical things about making Jesus Christ the center of your life. And then the second thing I want to say in, 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 in reference to our review from last week is this, is that allow Christ to lead you. Allow him to lead you. Follow the Lord. Follow the Lord. Uh, when Jesus was uh, walking this earth, here was his invitation to people. Follow me. Follow me. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with this, but he did not say, uh, uh, do you, do you want to do you, do you be with me? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Pray this prayer with me. He didn't do that. He just looked at him and said, you, you want to be with me? Follow me. Follow me. And, and, and here's, here's the thing that, that we neglect sometimes is that we're not looking for converts. We're looking for disciples. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So follow the Lord. Here's a scripture from Galatians. I think I have it up there on the board. Galatians chapter five, verse 25. Since we are living by the spirit, let us follow the spirit's leading in every part of our lives. New Living Translation. Every part of our lives. That's guys on the golf course Ladies at the supermarket. Yeah. Follow. We, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit in every part of our lives. Now, tonight, I, I want to move on just, just uh, uh, briefly into some areas of the tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was a place to meet with God. We, we've discussed that. We've talked about it. It was a place of worship. It was a place that was holy and, and sacred. It was a place of sacrifice where sin was dealt with. Sin was dealt with and, and forgiveness was available. And, and there was release from, from, from sin in, in, this, in this place called the tabernacle. It was a place that ultimately spoke of, the, of, of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, tonight, could I have that first? Oh, it's already up there. Hi. Uh, this is the tabernacle. Uh, I showed this to you last week, but, but let me just review it just for a moment. There was uh, a tent, uh, a, a curtain around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was 150 feet by 75 feet. Um, there was a gate always on the east, always on the east. You would walk through the gate. The first, the first the first thing you would run into, you couldn't go any farther than the, than the brazen altar, which was dealt with sin. There was, a, there was, the, there was the, 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 all, the brazen laver, which was next, and then the, the holy place and the, and the holy of holy places. Place. But tonight, let me, um, let me read you a scripture. I don't have this up here, but let me just read it to you um, from the New Living Translation, Exodus 27. You might want to write that down, Exodus 27, 9 through 19. Then make the courtyard for the tabernacle. This is God's instruction to Moses. Enclose the curtains made of finely woven linen. On the south side, make the curtains 150 feet long. They will be held up by 20 posts set securely in 20 
brass or brazen sockets or bases. Hang the curtains with silver hooks and brings. Make the curtains on the same side, north side, 150 feet, held by 20 posts set securely in brass bases. Uh, hang the curtains with silver hooks and, and, and rings. The curtains on the west side will be 75 feet long, supported by 10 posts set into 10 bases. The east uh, end of the courtyard, the front, uh, will also be 75 feet, and the courtyard entrance will be to the east, flanked by two curtains. You'll see that up there. The curtains on the right side will be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set by three bases. The curtains on the left side will be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts and three bases. Uh, just, just a couple more verses. For the, for the entrance of the courtyard made of curtains, there will be 30, that will be 30 feet long. Make it of fine twined linen and decorate it with beautiful embroidery of, of blue and purple and scarlet thread. In other words, the, the entrance was different from from the rest of the curtain. All the posts uh, will be of silver and hooks of brass. Uh, so the entire courtyard will be 150 feet long by 75 feet wide. And the curtain, uh, and the curtain will be seven and a half feet, just seven and a, seven and a half feet high, made of fine, uh, finely woven linen. Um, so tonight, let me, let me talk to you about the stark difference between... Um, the outside of the tabernacle, and as they approached the tabernacle, what they saw. The Israelites' tents were made of goat hair. Most believe, most, most believe that the tents were probably of a darker color. And that's what the Israelites lived in. They lived in tents. They surrounded the tabernacle. But the tabernacle was different in that the, the curtain was made of fine, finely woven white linen. White linen. And why was that? Why, why is there such a stark difference between where Israel lived and where they worshipped? It was because God wanted to see that there's a, there's a marked separation between the world and the kingdom. Between the world and the kingdom. The, uh, the white linen spoke of the pure righteousness of God. Only available, uh, we know this, through salvation. So uh, this evening, can I speak to you just, a, just for a moment about what righteousness really is? Because that's what Israel saw when they looked at this, at this presence of God, this, uh, this place of worship, this place of, uh, that housed God's glory. They saw a white curtain surrounding and um, it spoke, again, let me say that clearly, of righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Well, let me define righteousness for you. Righteousness is a state of moral correctness. It is uprightness. Uh, it's, uh, uh, let me say it this way, it's being in right relationship with God, okay? Uh, uh, let me say it another way. It's being accepted by God. It's being accepted by God. How many of you this evening desire to be accepted by God? It should be every one of us wants to be accepted by God, right? So, so what is this thing called righteousness? And, and, and with that in mind, let me, let me read you a scripture. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 and 7. We are all infected. We're all infected and impure with sin. We... When we dis display our unrighteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Wow, that's kind of in your face, isn't it? We are all. Uh, Rome, Paul follows that up with Romans chapter 3. Here's what it says. As the scripture says, there's none righteous. There's none righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have, all have turned away. All have become useless no, not one good, N not one single righteous person, none. And, and wasn't that our state before we came to Christ? We were unrighteous. So how do we acquire righteousness? Well, here's what a lot of people believe. If, I'll just, if I can just clean up my act, if I can just get my life right, if I can just 
quit doing this and start doing that, if I can just, if I can just overcome this and, 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 and work with that, uh, I'll surely inherit righteousness. No. Um, there are people who live better by accident than some of you live by purpose. And that's the truth. Um, so that, that doesn't get it. The distinction between a child of God and a person of the world is this. And, and, and I'm just read it to you. We placed our trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and nothing else. And I know you'd agree with that. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree with that? That, 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 that is, that's what makes us righteous. Uh, and, and here's the verse. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God that raised him from the dead will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, right? And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's Romans chapter 10, verses nine through 10. Now, the apostle Paul, when he wrote that, was really uh, helping us to understand that when we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart, God declares us righteous. Why? I wonder why he said this. When you uh, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God that raised him from the dead. Why didn't he say, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he died on the cross for you? Why did he say, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead? Uh, why didn't he say, uh, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus performed miracle after miracle after miracle? didn't say that. He said, believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead because the resurrection, this is a good point, the resurrection from the dead completed the work of Christ. It completed it. The finished work of Christ. Resurrection. You say, well, what made his resurrection so important? Because there was probably seven or eight other people that, re that was resurrected from the dead. I can think of a couple myself, one being Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So, what, so what's the big deal about Jesus? Well, every other person that was raised from the dead would die again. Jesus was the only one that was raised from the dead by God the Father that would never die again. Boy, that, that'll make a Baptist into a Pentecostal right there. Really, I'm telling you, Jesus is the only one that will never die again. And because he lives, guess what? We live. We live. Hallelujah. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we confess with our mouth, Lord Jesus Christ, confession is made unto salvation. Believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. There's something about, uh, with, with, let me read to you. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. Let, let me just make an observation. Purely an observation. Purely an observation. Righteousness is declared over you when you believe. But your salvation is confirmed when you open your mouth. See, God doesn't have any silent Christians. Well, maybe they won't know. God doesn't have any silent Christians. Neither does he have any grandchildren. Uh, for, you to, for you to say, um, gee, I've just, I was just been in church all my life and I, I'm, I'm a Christian because of that. No. Listen, just because just you've been in church doesn't make you a, a child of God, does it? And we know that, don't we? Don't we know that? There must come a time in your life when there is a, what, what we call a conversion. There's, there has to come a time in your life when there, is a, when there is a transformation that takes place in your life and God declares you righteous. Righteous. Now, to be quite honest with you, uh, there's a lot of religious organizations, a lot of religious institutions that would tell you that uh, in order to be righteous, you've got to do this. And the whole reason for writing the book of Galatians is the Apostle Paul said, once you started in grace and faith, now you've come back to the law. What, 
you're fo- so foolish. You're so foolish. Why do you do that? So we know that we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. I so appreciate that song. They, they didn't even know my message tonight, and they sang that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was looking out for that. My chains are gone. I've been set free. Um, yeah, We're, we are saved not by works. But listen to me. Here's the afterthought. Here's the, here's the thought I want to convey to you. So many of us, so many of us are saved by grace, but we live our Christian lives based on works. You can't mix Old and New Testament. Let me, say, let, me let that sink in for a minute. We, we are saved under the new covenant and then we revert back to the old covenant when we live our Christian life. How do I know that? Because that was my experience. Can I just share with you just for a moment? Um, I was raised in a Christian home. My father was a pastor. And we were raised to perform. Do you understand what I'm saying by that? We were raised to perform like Christians. My dad said, you, I remember him saying this, you know, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Because what would other people think? If you're living your Christian life based upon what other people think, you are living in works. Boy, is it quiet in here. Is it just me or am I, uh, did all of you leave for, did you go some? Uh, yeah, it's true. We, we, are, we know that we're saved by grace. We cannot, we cannot be saved by works. We know that. But we live our lives based upon if I do good, God's going to like me. Let me just, can I tell you this tonight? And this is not preaching, but let me just tell you this tonight. God smiles at you consistently all day long. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, did you, God didn't see what I just did. Oh, yes, he did. He saw that. And he still smiles at you because righteousness has been imparted to you. <laughs> Don't live your life based upon what you can do for God. And, and uh, I, um, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, um, working in the church doesn't make you any more close to God than if you do nothing in the church. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say that. Oh, let me go back here. Wait a minute. Uh, um, let me, uh, uh, um, oh, uh, I'm in trouble already. I just feel I'm in trouble already. Uh, uh, volunteering in the church doesn't make you any more righteous than non-volunteering in the church. It's, oh, I know I'm in trouble now. Oh, God, help me. Jesus, get me out of this mess. Oh, God, help me. Why? Because you're basing what you do on his love for you. And I'm I'm telling you that he loves you regardless. Now, am I saying you shouldn't volunteer? You need to volunteer. Yeah, yeah, get involved in the church. Get involved in the church. Do, Do all you can do in the church. Yes, absolutely. But don't base your relationship with Christ on that. See, we get the cart before the horse. We say, if I'll just do good, God will love me. No, God loves you, and then because of his love for you, your, your behavior is good. See, we, we just get it all turned around backwards, see? So, uh, and, and here's the thing. Uh, uh, since I'm in trouble, I just will go all the way here, just jump into the fire all the way. Uh, some of you, uh, listen to this, I, and I'm not, it's, it's those other people that aren't here tonight. That's who I'm talking to. <laughs> listen, some, <laughs> some people... Some people in the church are the in word of life. They're in every church that only do things to impress the pastor. I'm so sorry, God. (laughs) True. You want the pastor to know you're here on Sunday morning. You know what's more important? That God knows you're here on Sunday morning. You, You understand what I'm talking about? 
um, is it has to do with declared righteousness. Um, I am so far off my notes. I am so, oh man. Um, let, me, let, let, me, let me get back to my notes here for just a second. Um, here's a scripture. For with the heart, this is from the Amplified. For with the heart, a person believes, he adheres to, he trusts in, he relies on Christ. And so is justified, declared righteous, acceptable to God. And with the mouth, he confesses, declares openly and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. Romans chapter 11, verse six. There is no other way. There is nothing we can add to our faith to obtain right relationship with God. Um, I came from a tradition that I had to dress right. I had to act right. And if I didn't, it was implied that God didn't like me. And I am just so appalled at that. You know, I've, I've, I'll be honest with you. I've changed my theologies so much. Um, much that, yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. My theology is always changing. Um, but I, I used to believe that. Um, I sat in a movie theater. This is, this is the absolute truth. I sat in a movie theater one uh, evening, and I was probably a junior in high school, and I watched uh, West Side Story. Remember that West Side Story? I watched West Side Story, and I sat there in that movie theater praying that Jesus would not come back because I felt in my heart if Jesus came back and I was sitting in that movie theater, I wouldn't go in the rapture. You know what that is? That's bondage. Bondage. I didn't know that God declared me righteous. <laughs> By the way, I enjoyed the movie, but, uh, <laughs> but I sat there and prayed the whole thing. And when it was over, I actually ran out of the theater. I was just a junior in high school. I can't remember what I did yesterday, but I can remember that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Because we live under such bondage. And, and uh, we place that on ourselves. Here's, here's what Andrew Womack says. It's commonly thought that our actions are the, are the, determining, the, the determining factor in God's judgment of, of our righteousness. That's not true, he says. There's a relationship between our actions and the right standing with God. And, and I, I'm, I, I agree with that. But right relationship with God produces those actions, not the other way around. That is to say that we are not made righteous by what we do. Religion has preached to us that if we can clean up our actions, our heart will be also be cleaned up. And that's just not true. It is not our actions that make us acceptable to God, the Father. It's our trust in Jesus that imparts the righteousness of Jesus into our born again spirit and makes us right in right standing with God. We receive salvation by putting on, putting total faith in Christ and forgiveness of our sins. But he says, but then many of us believing that the Lord still relates to them on the basis of their works after that enter into a works mentality, he said, we shouldn't do that. Failure to understand this truth, listen to this, failure, failure to understand this truth is the root of all guilt and condemnation because we're never good enough. I never thought I was good enough. I never, so I made trips to the altar time after time after time after time after time. I got saved a million times. Oh God, please forgive me. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying to God for forgiveness. But how, how many of you know, um, when you're declared righteous, you're declared righteous. And God loves you. Uh, uh, another scripture here, and we'll move on. Titus chapter three, verse five. Here's what it says. He saved us, not because of, our righteous, not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Man, yeah. Yeah, I'll clap my hands for that too. That's a, that's a good one. That's a good verse. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Well, when Israel looked at the, at the, at the, tent, at the, at the curtain, they, they understood the righteousness and the holiness of God. And 
to gain access to this righteousness. There was one gate. There wasn't two gates, there was one gate. And it always stood on the east side. It was always pointed east. So Israel had to go west when they entered the gate. But that gate was different. Do you see the difference between the white linen and the gate? The gate was, was of white linen, but it had embroidery on it. It had embroidery of, of, of blue and purple and scarlet. And, and that really represents uh, the gospels uh, of, uh, of Christ. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, th- there was th- the blue... It was, was typical uh, and, and symbolic of that, that heavenly, glorious nature of God. And, and really, the gospel writer that talks about the glorious nature of God is, was John. When you read the book of John, you'll see so much about God's glory and, and his relationship with the Father. It talks about that heavenly wonder of, of Jesus. Uh, the purple represents the, the kingliness of Jesus. And Matthew is the gospel that, that really... Uh, relates to us that kingly nature of Christ. Uh, scarlet uh, represents uh, uh, the, the obedient servant, uh, the, the, the dying servant. And Mark uh, uh, helps us to understand that, that the obedient dying servant uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And quite, of course, uh, represents the, the, the perfect man. And Luke does a phenomenal job in relating that to us. But there was one gate. Whether you were rich whether you were poor, whether you were young, whether you were old, whether you were a priest, whether you were a king, it didn't matter. You all had to come through the same gate. You all had to come through the same gate. Here's, here's what, just a couple of scriptures. I don't have them up there, but I'll just give them to you. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. John chapter 10, verse 9. Yes, I am the gate, Jesus said. Those who come in and through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pasture. John chapter 10, verse 7. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall be in and out and find pasture. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber. One gate. And that gate is salvation. That gate is a born-again relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no other way to attain righteousness. There's no other way. You can't be good enough to inherit God's righteousness. You can't do it. It's impossible. The only way is to come through the gate. And when you come through the gate, the very first thing you encounter is the brazen altar. It's the second slide up here. It was uh, seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long. It was a square box. It was only four and a half feet high. Is that about four and a half feet? Yeah. Uh, Great on top so that they could lay the wood and the sacrifices there. But picture in your mind what, what went on when an Israelite would come through that gate. He would come and line up, because there was always a line, <laughs> with his animal in tow in his hands, whether it was a sheep or a goat or, or an ox or whatever it was, he would, he would bring that animal and wait his turn to approach the altar. The, the, the ground around this brazen altar was soaked with blood. Soaked with blood. Uh, the priest standing doing their priestly functions, whether they, were, whether they were killing the animal, whether they were placing the animal on the altar, whether they were, were cleaning out the ashes uh, from, from the brazen altar, whatever they were laying hands on, on, the, on the animal, whatever they were doing, the priests were wearing robes soaked with dirt and grime and blood. Can you imagine the noise that came from that particular place Um, animals being sacrificed, animals being placed upon the altar. Uh, It was repulsive. 
That's the only word there was for it. It was repulsive. It was awful. Uh, And may I just say to you that uh, sin is repulsive to the Father. Breaks his heart. Um, but, but it was the only way that, that, that sin could be dealt with. The brazen altar was a place where the judgment of sin was transferred from an innocent animal. And, and, that, and, that, and that guilt and that shame was placed upon that animal so that the individual could stand guiltless and free. Wow. Here's what Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And here's the sad thing. Here's the sad thing. That covenant, the the, the covenant of the tabernacle, it only released or covered sin. It didn't do away with it. It just covered it for the time being. The, the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood on the, on the Ark of the Covenant. And it only lasted for one year. He had to do it again year after year after year after year. And the Israelites had to come back time after time after time after time. <laughs> but let me say this to you. And I know it's getting late. But let me say this to you. Jesus died once and for all. Never again to deal with sin. He died once and for all. There was no coming back and saying, oh God, I did it again. God, I hit my brother again. Daggone, I didn't mean to do it, but I did it. Here's another lamb. Once and for all, the sacrifice of Christ made for you. Was it repulsive? Yeah. Yeah. Was it terrible? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going into all that. We've, we've talked about that before. Christ was beaten beyond recognition. The book of Isaiah says he was beaten beyond recognition. Hung on a cross. Displayed for people to see. Listen, these quaint little pictures of Jesus on the cross doesn't do any... No. We don't understand the awfulness of crucifixion. It was terrible, drenched in blood. And he did that for us, but he did it once for everyone. Done, finished. And when he said it is finished, let me tell you something, all of heaven rejoiced, it is finished. No more sacrifice, no more sacrifice, no more. Here's what John said. John said, behold the Lamb of God that does what? Covers up? No, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It takes away takes it away. And here's the thing. Um, here's the message, and I'll close. Here's the message I want you to hear tonight. And, and uh, um, remind me, I stopped right there. Because uh, next week we have praise and worship. Hallelujah. It's going to be a night of worship and glory and anointing. And praise God, it's going to be good. So come next week. Um, let me just tell you one more thing. Um, you need to quit carrying around your sin. It was dealt with at the cross. You need to quit condemning yourself and saying, man, I am such a terrible person. Stop it. Stop it. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. Do you know what Jesus paid for you so that you could become righteous? It is an insult to the kingdom of God for you to walk around discouraged and depressed and, and, and feeling like I'm so unworthy. Stop it. Stop it. You're a child of God. The, Jesus paid the ultimate price so that you could be saved. So start acting like it. Start acting like it. You're a child of God. You know, I, I, I get so tired of this, this syndrome. I'm just a worm. Oh, please. Please. Get over it. I can't quite end there. That's really heavy. (laughs) I just thought about that. I can't quite end there. Um, (laughs) 
But I, I can't end with this, uh, you know, that, that the exchange took place at Calvary. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus took the penalty of your sin. He died for you. The work is done. It's completed. Everything is finished. And, and the price has been paid. And you can live in victory today because Jesus Christ paid the price for you. It's done. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that you are blessed and encouraged by our service. And we invite you to join us again next week. Our services go live every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and at wordoflife.church. And we also meet in person every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. If God is using our church to change your life and you'd like to help us lead people to life in Jesus through giving, you can do so by visiting wordoflife.church give, or you can text your donation amount to 84321. Follow along with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube if you'd like to know more about what God is doing in and through our church. God is doing incredible things here, and we are so honored that you chose to spend your time with us.